Right, uh, Justice Jaratnam, Justice Alsop, Rajda, friends and colleagues, thank you for joining us this evening for this panel discussion and book launch. We're delighted to have a distinguished panel to share their thoughts on ADR and the growth of international commercial courts. If I could start by introducing the panel, uh, Justice Philip Jaratnam is known to many of us, having been a distinguished litigator and an arbitration practitioner prior being elevated to the bench. I had the privilege of appearing before Justice Jaratnam when he was sole arbitrator. I think I believe it was one of his last cases before he was appointed a judge of the High Court. Justice Jaratnam is president of the Singapore International Commercial Court. Justice James Alsop, among his many appointments, was the Chief Justice of the Federal Court of Australia. Justice Alsop was recently appointed to the SICC. Congratulations. Last but not least, Rashda Rana, the editor of the book. Rashda is also known to many of us here, having spent several years in Singapore and Australia before moving to London. Rashda is an experienced commercial and construction senior counsel and has practiced across the globe. And despite her busy schedule, she has found the time to write this book, which I am sure will be of benefit to both in-house counsel and ADR practitioners. In terms of format, Justice Alsop will kick us off with his thoughts on the development of ADR in recent years. Um, Justice Jaratnam will then share some observations on the intersection between ADR and the courts. We will move on to a panel discussion thereafter. Uh, we'd like to keep this as interactive as possible, so please, we do welcome comments and questions during the panel discussion. Um, this is a rare opportunity to come up close with such a distinguished panel of judges and practitioners, so please take the opportunity to put forward your burning questions. So if I could now invite Justice Alsop to start us off. Do you want to go up and lecture? If you'll forgive, for, if he is, yes, if you'll for, forgive me, um, I'm not sure what focus length I need. There we are. Well, it's a great pleasure uh, and a great honour to be um, uh, uh, asked to speak this evening with the President and Rashta and Paul. Um, I, I, this is um, a, a both a timely second edition and um, a, 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 again, an exceptionally valuable discussion of different aspects of um, ADR, as people use the expression, alternative or alternatives of dispute resolution uh, or appropriate dispute resolution. I'll say a little bit more about the book um, <clears throat> in a moment. But um, there have been important uh, developments in the decade or so uh, since the first edition. Um, and one of those developments is a slow but uh, steady uh, appreciation in all jurisdictions uh, engaged in particular in trade and commerce and construction of the different types of alternative or appropriate dispute resolution, their interconnection and their utility depending upon the circumstances of the problem and the parties involved. <clears throat> and very often what works for one dispute won't work for an almost identical dispute uh, because the parties are not identical and the parties have different characteristics and different attitudes, both generally uh, to uh, dispute resolution uh, or more particularly because of the characteristics of this dispute of this dispute to be resolved. And what's occurred in the last decade, I think, so, and really it's an extension of what's occurred in different parts of the trading world and, and the legal world in which people at gatherings like this work in, is a more general appreciation of the variety and utility of different kinds of dispute resolution. 
<clears throat> and to go to the book, that is one of uh, its great strengths, is that it's not a book only about mediation or facilitation uh, or ARB Med or Med ARB, but it's a it's a it's a discussion of the uh, the full gamut of the types of tools and approaches that one can use. I think one needs to be careful about over taxonomizing this and, 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 and as if these are different, entirely different self-contained processes. They have their differences, but they are all part of a, a way of looking at dispute resolution uh, as a continuum uh, and as a, uh, a state of mind or, a, or an approach to problems that it's all to do with problem solving, ultimately, because that ultimately is uh, what uh, litigation, whether it's arbitral or, or curial, is it's decision making problem solving. Um, but what has occurred uh, across this region and uh, and across Europe uh, uh, and 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 the Americas is a growing realization that decisional uh, dispute resolution, important and indeed uh, uh, not just necessary but unavoidable as it is, uh, is is facilitated and made less costly and more effective by being surrounded in its place and in its timing by the thoughtful use of uh, the kinds of uh, alternative or appropriate uh, mechanisms of facilitation and agreement. And, uh, and we have the example of this city being at the uh, at the centre of the international developments on this, with the structure of the Singapore Convention uh, and the placing of uh, uh, a cognate enforcement structure around mediation uh, that uh, exists in arbitration. Um, and you, one can see this in the kinds of clauses that are far more frequent than they used to be. Uh, one often found in in construction and t technology and construction contracts, uh, which was really certainly in Australia where I come from, the forerunner of sophisticated use of agreements and cascading um, uh, dispute resolution clauses with executive negotiation, good faith bargaining, mediation, uh, and then arbitration. But that, <clears throat> that has become far more uh, prevalent uh, and not limited uh, to um, the construction industry. Um, I won't uh, steal the President's thunder um, in relation to developments uh, in the international, Singapore International Court and Singapore uh, with this. He'll say something about that. Um, But one thing I wanted to give you an illustration of was what's happened in Australia in the last, say, 30 years, 30 or 40 years. They're, they're, they're developed in the 1980s a thriving um, private mediation uh, industry, if you like, in, in Sydney. Um, <clears throat> not just there were some retired judges, the former Chief Justice of New South Wales, Lawrence Street, was a powerful, uh, 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 powerful um, uh, proponent of this when he retired. Um, but it, it grew uh, from uh, it grew from an enthusiasm of the profession to minimise the use to the extent possible of courts. Meanwhile, in another city uh, south of the Murray, in Melbourne, what developed almost at the same time, perhaps a little bit later, was court 
Arts inspired and sponsored mediation through registrars trained and skilled uh, to uh, engage in court and next mediation. And, and I remember at judges' meetings, Melbourne judges would say rather sniffily to Sydney judges, you people don't understand the importance of mediation, to which Sydney judges would say, you people are coming to this late. We've been doing, our profession's been doing this for years and it's done privately. Nothing comes to the court without an attempt at mediation. And, and, and that, from the 80s and 90s into the 2000s, and the last decade or so has spread across the country and, and you have the regular unstructured but imaginative use of uh, facilitation, early neutral evaluation, mock trials and, uh, and the like, uh, as well as the traditional use of mediation. MedArb and Arb Med have not really taken off. Um, the federal court has 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 judges being mediators in its rules, but it doesn't happen, um, largely because um, the views being taken in Australia, certainly in the two courts that I've worked in, that judges have got better things. We've paid a lot of money to get these people to this point, <laughs> with all their staff, uh, and uh, they're there to do the deciding, and you surround them either with skilled professionals or skilled registrars to, uh, to do the mediation. And the one aspect that I've always thought is um, underutilised in many courts uh, is the use of mediation, even when you know that you won't settle the thing completely, of, of stripping away through goodwill and common sense or a lot of the detritus and stripping and pruning the tree to, to get to the point where you have the real decisional question that needs deciding. Uh, and, 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 it's, and it's had an effect on, this is the last thing I'll say, it's had an effect on how commercial litigation is fought now in Australia. You have a mindset now of people going to court to say, well, how can we simplify this? What really do we need this person for? And how, so what would help us resolve this case? And those old decisions about, well, you can't have a separate issue unless the whole thing is going to be settled in, in many courts have gone by the board. And it's, how can we help? We will decide the construction and interpretation issue of the policy or the contract or this issue or that issue, then you can go away and resolve it. So it's actually court first, mediation second sometimes because people have got that imaginative framework in their heads about how do we solve, how do we skin this cat? How do we solve this problem? Uh, it might be a three week, it might be a mediation while the litigation is going on. It might be this, it might be that. And, and if I may say so, the kind of thoughtful uh, structure of this book uh, uh, helps uh, with that imaginative process by giving it some structure and, and some historical context and geographic context. So if I may uh, congratulate the authors uh, and um, pass, pass on to the um, President. Thank you, Justice Olson. Justice Jarrettnam. new and different from the first edition 10 years ago. And that's for the simple reason that 10 years is actually a long time. And so having congratulated them. OK, it wasn't on, but my voice is already probably too loud in any event. But it's being recorded, I'm told. So OK. Um, so having congratulated them, I'm going to have to 
urge them to renew and refresh the book before another 10 years elapse. So hopefully this is going to be a, perhaps a five yearly thing. And 10 years is a long time because what has happened in those last 10 years? Well, one of those things is the establishment of the Singapore International Commercial Court, which plays a significant role in the whole business of cross-border dispute resolution. And I think in those 10 years, we have moved strikingly towards emphasizing the importance of integrated dispute resolution management. Now, what has that responded to? I think that's responded to a couple of things. So one is that uh, just life, the world, business, it just becomes more and more complex every day. And there are at least three parts to that uh, complexity. There's uh, the increasing technical complexity of the things and the machines and all that around us. There's the increasing organizational complexity as we layer on different accountability and different obligations and people have to worry about all sorts of different uh, uh, things that are pulled in different directions. And, um, and then there is perhaps uh, most important or most significantly for disputes, the whole increase in evidential complexity where now we have uh, these streams of uh, WhatsApps and emails. And uh, when, you know, when I look at a matter, say a construction project now, w when I started practice, it was very easy. It was already pre-organized by the people on site into your daily reports, your weekly uh, meetings, minutes of weekly meetings, your monthly uh, uh, reports and so forth. Uh, now it's all unprocessed. You have to plow through uh, reams and reams of emails in order to understand it. So that's one thing which I think has driven having to take on more active management. And then the other is, I think, the increased sense that relational relationships are important, long-term relationships are important, uh, not just for long-term relational contracts, but just the relationship which may give rise to a number of contracts over time between the same players. And these two things, I think, have led to two important developments. One is we increasingly emphasize how we manage quickly, timely, nip in the bud, small disputes before they can spiral and harm relationships. And so I'm thinking of adjudication, I'm thinking of dispute boards. The second response is actually to think about how we can unbundle large disputes, disputes which are so complicated that it's very hard for one person to grasp it. You know, it's different when you're, you know, counsel like Paul, you have a whole team and then everybody gets one little bit. But then think of the poor decision maker, the judge, the arbitrator, who then has to get it somehow into their head and then process it and then uh, um, digest it and then ultimately produce uh, some form of synthesized uh, resolution of everything. So that... Um, it, the, that's something that, Jay, uh, that Justice Alsop uh, talked about um, towards the end of what he said, where he spoke about how one might um, make a decision on a point of law in court and then send off the, um, the, the, the business of assessing, say, defects or something else against that interpretation to another uh, person or another body to, to deal with. Um, so those two things together uh, come together, I think, in how uh, courts have developed responses. Um, and also, I'm going to then talk a little bit about a, a new pilot scheme that is that has just uh, been announced in, in Chief's uh, opening of Legal Year speech that you may have heard of. And then uh, that you may, may have heard of this word when I come to it, the name of it. But if you haven't, this is a chance for me to... to, to, to uh, emphasize it. So active case management, I think, is part of this, where when matters come before courts or in, uh, and actually courts have this, uh, because of the powers that courts have, with the right spirit and the right attitude, uh, they can actively help clients to, or ha actually actively help parties 
to, to work out which is the best avenue for different parts of the dispute. Now for yourselves as general counsel, thinking about this, thinking about the active uh, case management, thinking about how you plan for the management of a dispute, thinking about how you actually manage it when you're in the middle of a dispute becomes increasingly important. And um, if courts, if you, if you don't have a court to do it, this is where I come to the scheme and I'll just mention it, and that is uh, this Intergraph, which has been being piloted by the Singapore Mediation Center. And something I, I've actually, it, 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 it's a concept that I've spoken about previously, but it's now uh, taking reality. And the idea of Intergraph is that um, when two parties are faced with a dispute, uh, which has many different aspects, uh, sometimes it's bewildering as to where you should send particular parts of the dispute to. And sometimes you need a third party to actually help direct you. And I've used this expression of a signal person. So Intergraph plays the role of a signal person. Like you have trains running long tracks. In the old days, you needed somebody to actually switch the tracks and sort of wave their arms and tell you which way you're supposed to be going. And Intergraph, which stands for Integrated uh, Resolution of, uh, of Disputes, um, is, uh, is, is something that you as general counsel can think about choosing in your, um, in your, when you are negotiating a contract or think about choosing when you actually get to the point of, of, of having a complicated uh, a, a dispute. And so Google it later, Intergraph, and you can learn uh, more about it. I think that's where I'll end it, uh, except that I should add one more exciting development, <laughs> echoing what I, uh, returning to what I, I spoke about in the, Justice Alsop is now one of our international judges. And so that's an added pleasure of being able to be here on this uh, panel this evening with him. Thank you, Justice Jaratnam. So we're going to have a discussion on some topics on ADR and, and perhaps I'll, I'll kick off um, first. I mean, I mean, in the past decade, has have seen um, the growth of sophisticated in-house counsel teams, and I'm glad quite a number of attendees here today are from in-house counsel uh, within corporate organizations. And I think the question is, what support do you think they should have available to them to expand their knowledge about ADR? And perhaps, Rashda, you could kick us off on that. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And welcome, everyone. Lovely to see you all here. And I'd just like to thank the President and Justice also myself as well, because um, something that perhaps you're not aware, but we all have had a hand, as it were, in the book. Um, so I started the book, and Justice also very kindly wrote my first forward in the first edition. And then um, I managed to uh, press gang Paul into contributing to the book, and um, Justice um, Jaya Ratnam very kindly wrote the forward to the second book. So we are all part of this book. And I hope you'll all be part of the book by taking up um, what it tries to guide you to do. But one of the things I really wanted to mention was the genesis of the book. So not a lot of people know this, but even though I'm a barrister, I actually went in-house to Lend-Lease uh, about 2009-ish. And one of the things I realized was that the business, and including some of the in-house legal team, didn't actually understand the differences between the smorgasbord of ways to resolve issues and conflicts and disputes um, that naturally arise, I'm afraid. It's kind of absolutely inevitable there will be a dispute in a construction project. And this was a uh, de property development and construction company. Uh, it's a global one. Um, to the point when there was an issue, the business would say to me in one sentence, so if we go to adjudication, which mediator should we choose and how is the arbitration going to run? You know, so they were all synonymous things and they all meant, you know, we're not going to court, basically. So I thought, I kept saying, no, adjudication, and arbitration, that mediator. Um, and then quite coincidentally, so the universe was listening, if you believe in all that. I probably do, actually. Um, LexisNexis approached me and said, would I write a book which would explain those concepts to lay people, particularly to commercial people, but also in-house legal counsel, 
who are actually required to be, you know, everything from a, a podiatrist to a brain surgeon in terms of the legal breadth that they're expected to know. Um, and it wasn't unusual when I was at GC to find matters that had been sent, complicated construction matters, that the business had sent to their mate who was a family law lawyer, and that's all he did. Um, so there is this notion that if you're a lawyer, you can do any old law, and that's fine. Um, so for lawyers, but also for uh, the business, I thought it was really important to try and give them just a handle, just uh, four corners of the structure of the avenues that are open for dispute resolution. So it's not intended to be a textbook deliberately because people won't open it and read it if it is. It is meant to be something you can dip into. If, some, if the business comes to you and says, they want to do mediation, what's all that about? You can hopefully read the chapter and you'll know enough to be able to explain it to the business. So I think this is an, another tool that I thought would be useful for in-house counsel as well as business people to help them work out how to deal with their disputes efficiently, expediently, and hope, hopefully economically. Just also. And, and that, uh, and that focus that Rashta had on uh, general counsel um, is hugely important uh, as part of uh, another aspect of le legal and commercial culture that uh, needs to be recognised, and that is that there is an inevitably a, a functional divide between transactional lawyers and litigation lawyers. It, 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 that can't be done away with, but they have to understand. They have to understand each other, and they have to understand what each other does. Uh, and, and that's the most obvious thing. Uh, it, what the most obvious illustration of that is, is the lack of appreciation of many transactional lawyers about the importance of the dispute resolution clause, and that how how much of the hard won gains from all that wonderful drafting and negotiation can be flushed away if you choose the wrong tribunal or the wrong mechanism of dispute resolution. Uh, and, and bringing those cultures together uh, and, and having litigation lawyers who understand a deal and transaction lawyers who understand litigation um, is, is part of tr legal training, but it's also a mindset of problem solving. And I said it earlier, uh, and that's one thing that has to be not only developed, it doesn't, isn't it like a building that's built and then it's uh, ready for occupation and that's it. It's, it's a culture that has to be fed and, reju and rejuvenated and, and, and nurtured generation after generation. Uh, and, and part of that is the role of general counsel, I think, uh, of, of being able to bring the business people to, uh, to an understanding of how their problems can be solved. And the other thing that is central to this and, and, and um, uh, vital to understand in choosing which of the smorgasbord, as Rashta said, of tools, is you've got to understand the people you're dealing with. <laughs> And uh, I used to divide lawyers into type A lawyers and type B lawyers. Type A lawyers wanted to solve the problems for their clients and type B lawyers wanted the problem to stay and to be uh, a source of revenue. Uh, and and uh, yeah, yeah, always looking for the high court point. Um, thank you, said the client. Um, but really in that litigation culture, you will, you, and you know who they are, or the people you deal with. There may be some of your partners, or, but you have to realistically understand what will work for the dispute, and what will work for the people in the dispute. Uh, and that's uh, again one of the great strengths of the book. 
um, it gives you the full range to apply those tools to, and you've got to understand what's the problem, how it's to be solved with these folk uh, that you're dealing with. I'll just uh, develop a little bit from there because I, you know, what Justice Alsop has said uh, is so critical, this attitude of, uh, of problem solving. And I'd just add to that, I mean, it's problem solving for what? And it is problem solving for the needs of the business. And I think that's something that as lawyers, uh, we have to keep remembering. Um, and it's something indeed that as judges and arbitrators, it also needs to be top of mind that ultimately what one is designing, the processes, the procedures and so forth has to meet the needs of the people one is serving. Uh, and in the case of commercial litigation, that's uh, the needs of business or international business. Um, and as general counsel, you're providing that link between the business and the legal world. And so it become you're really central to that bringing to it uh, this sense of, uh, of understanding the, uh, the business that you're working in and then having the knowledge, in part, of course, from reading uh, Rashta's book uh, and from, any other, from other sources as well and from your own experience, then uh, applying, to that, uh, applying that knowledge to the needs of, of the business. Um, and I, I would just... Uh, perhaps commend one particular thing, which is that um, as you know, leave aside the, the, those lawyers who are type B lawyers, as Justice Alsop has mentioned, I think quite apart from those kinds of incentives, which we all know to be wrong and so forth, there is a, a perhaps a, a, a temptation which exists for any professional that, you know, you want to get things absolutely right and absolutely perfect. And so you worry a problem to death, you worry a dispute to death. Uh, and, I, and, and it's not necessarily for the sake of, you know, making the money out of it. It's for, it, it, it's sort of built into being, you know, this is your knowledge, your domain. And so you want to get to the right answer. But actually businesses, uh, don't necessarily need, uh, or rather a right answer, maybe to put it the other way around, a right, the right answer achieved after 20 years of uh, disputes is pretty useless to business. And so that's where you get the uh, development of, of forms of dispute resolution, which uh, are intended to give you a, at least a rough and ready answer. And uh, you get that rough and ready answer within a matter of months, and um, interestingly, as many of you know, where those rough and ready answers are given, in 95 or 99 percent of cases, the parties accept it, and they don't then spend spend the additional time, money, or effort to go on to you know cross the last t and dot the la and dot the last i in order to find the uh, the perfect answer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving on, I mean, I think the last decade has seen a tremendous growth in, in ADR and, and we'd like to hear your, your thoughts on how it's impacted the business community and perhaps Justice Alsop, you could kick us off there. I think, I think one of the reasons why um, there's been such a growth in ADR globally um, uh, has been both the, the growth in volume of business and the growth in the uh, not so much complexity but unfamiliarness uh, or lack of familiarity of of new technology. Um, uh, so you have more cross border disputes, and they are about some. Sometimes they are about uh, things using that word and broadest sense that are not familiar and the growth of I and the growth of true tech you know digital technology and IP um, both in its most recent manifestations that we're all grappling with um, but also in uh, in pharmaceuticals in digital analysis of problems 
um, the growth of IP into the core of daily business life, I think, has been uh, enormous. And and what that has meant for ADR is a growing well, a recognition, I think, by many businesses in many places, is that well, how are we going to solve this kind of problem? Which which courts? are going to have the skill. Now, you'll find good intellectual property courts in places around the world, but but they're not easy to find. And when you do find one, you know, do you find an IP judge with the, with the kind of background that you will need for this particular digital... Uh, uh, technology. Uh, they don't. They don't know how to spell blockchain. And you know, in the f days gone by, in commercial, now people understand it a lot better. But one of the reasons for non-take up of electronic bills of lading for those ships out there uh, is that the inertia of business life, not taking on new things unless they have to. Well. Many other businesses have been forced to uh, confront technology. So what do people do? They uh, obtain skilled assistance and resolve these problems without necessarily taking them to the courts. Now, it's, a, it's an important problem for the courts because the, the public courts have to confront this because otherwise you, you've got rights being dealt with outside, in, in, in a in an entirely uh, um, unstructured and uh, uncontrolled way, which not not for any sense of power, but it's not a good thing to have the state public resolution system not having a place in commerce, uh, commercial resolution. But that's one of the reasons, I think, um, and that is the growth not only of the activity uh, and the cross-border activity that we're all familiar with, but the growth of uh, technology. And I think the courts and, and institutions uh, like the International Commercial Court uh, uh, have this ability to um, sponsor below them or, 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 or to the side of them, not only their own skilled registrars, but also the kinds of um, uh, uh, procedures and structures that Intergraph is going to uh, be piloted. Um, and just to give you an illustration of this, one of the things we've done and we did, we've done, not there anymore, in the federal court, and I had some really good, a really good a couple of CEOs who had this idea of sponsoring in the court structure because we were self-administered, we didn't have have to deal with the Department of State. We were self-administered, and and we used to recruit laterally people from law firms, etc. So we'd get forty-five-year-old IP partners who were sick of the treadmill and wanted a change, and they were they were then the registrar looking after IP in the court and doing the mediations. And we had one years ago, South African man who was a ship surveyor and he got a master's from, from Hamburg University and he used to roam the country doing all our maritime arbitrations in all the ports around the country. So that ability to internalise skill within the courts to supplement private mediation is, is uh, in specialist areas where you can in a sense, buy some talent that you can't develop in a in a long term judge. I think is really valuable, uh, and um, uh, so I think those are some of the reasons. There are no doubt others. But... I I think to some extent I've already addressed uh, your question. The factors that have led to the growth of ADR globally, but perhaps just to take it a little, one, one step further. I, 
I do wonder, and I would propose that um, perhaps the A in ADR should be appropriate, the word appropriate rather than the word alternative, which would reflect the way in which, as we've discussed, uh, the, um, uh, the different methods of dispute resolution need to be integrated, need to be complementary. Perhaps one needs to be done at one point and another needs to take over and then perhaps return it and so forth. Um, and I think that that kind of appropriate dispute resolution uh, responds directly to what business, the, the international commercial business uh, needs um, globally. Um, and then I would just add one more point, which is picking up on uh, what uh, Justice Alsop had mentioned, which is, um, you know, where do courts fit into it? Um, and uh, and uh, apart from uh, courts in a individual dispute taking on those aspects which really courts are best suited to do, such as the interpretation of a contract before it goes to a mediation or it goes to uh, an evaluation or it goes to an assessment or whatever. Um, there is that critical point that um, when we talk about justice when, and when we talk about resolving a dispute, it has to be against something or with something in mind. And that something in mind is, well, what would happen if it were to be decided by a court? If we mediate, we cannot mediate in a vacuum. Indeed, if you mediate without the possibility of recourse to court, um, uh, as effectively might happen if you have a court system where you can't get your matter heard for a decade or whatever, um, then really the mediation becomes entirely detached from rights and wrongs and justice. And it just becomes a question of who's in a better bargaining position, who has more strength, who has more money, whatever. Um, and so it's important just to then relate it back. And, and courts play that important, that critical role of underpinning everything else that is going on. And, uh, you know, without wanting to be a booster, um, international commercial courts then play that role in relation to transnational commercial business and transnational uh, commercial uh, justice. Rashida, do you want to add anything further? Just, just very briefly, um, I think something that is emerging from the discussion is the central role, and we forget this sometimes, the central role that the business actually plays, because it's not the lawyer's dispute, wherever you are in-house or in a law firm or at the bar, it is actually the business's issue that they need dealt with as efficiently as possible. So the forms of dispute resolution really come out of the need for the business to find a way through. And, and construction is fantastic for this because it's been one of the most in innovative areas of, of uh, dispute resolution in, in terms of a, a legal area. Um, again, there are many, many moving parts on a construction site. People, things, whether everything can go wrong at any point of the day and can carry on going wrong for days and days and days. And so there's always been a need to find a way to resolve those issues before they blow up into something big. So I think the driver has always been the business, and both the President and the Justice also have mentioned how it is at the end of the day, what is it that the business needs for us as lawyers, wherever you are, to do in order to get there. And I think that's where all these avenues come from. I mentioned being in-house. One of the things that really struck me, um, and I, from time to time, have supported in-house teams on projects or particular things, sort of outside my role as a barrister, more as a sort of advisor, consultant, is actually how good commercial people are, especially senior managers, at resolving disputes. They are fantastic at negotiating. So I, the, the book actually contains a big chapter on... Uh, on senior executive negotiations because that is paramount and you'll find that as lawyers you probably don't hear about 
you know, 80% of disputes because they deal with them themselves. They might only come to you because they want a deed of variation or they want a settlement agreement, and that might be the first time you've actually heard that a big dispute's been dealt with quite efficiently. Just wanted to mention one little thing um, about the whether ADR is the right acronym now for where we find ourselves because of the enormous growth that we've had in the last 20, 25 years, which has also actually given rise to a new breed of lawyer. You know, there wasn't 25 years ago an arbitration lawyer or a mediation lawyer or, well, adjudication is a prime example, um, nearly all over the world now because, because of the number of jurisdictions that have a form of adjudication. Um, but I think what I quite like the idea is the appropriate, but I think appropriate alternatives for the resolution of disputes. That's a long title, but AARD, I quite like that rather than ADR. Um, so the next book might be called something slightly different, you know, formerly known as Prince, you know, so one of those titles. Um, the other thing I just wanted to say is um, just harking back to in-house counsel um, and how important their role is as that connector to the business and understanding what the business wants is, is the need to be a jack of all trades. Whereas I think what often happens in law firms and the bar is that you specialize, start to specialize very early. So the minute you've finished your, whatever the training is in your relevant jurisdiction, and after a year or two, you are actually now a construction lawyer, projects lawyer, IP lawyer, whatever lawyer, but you've forgotten everything else. And I think in-house, they're forced to remember everything else. And I think that's an important skill, actually, because that also teaches you how to deal with um, the business. But I think growth, 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 where we're not going to see uh, alternative, appropriate dispute resolution being... Uh, suddenly fading into the background, not at all. If anything, as you've heard from the judges, that uh, courts are actually embracing it and they're now part of that big jigsaw, which is about resolving problems. You know, dispute is a problem, somebody's problem, they've got to find a way through it. Um, so I think there's still room for, as, as the President said, I think it will be a book within the next five years. Paul, roll your sleeves up. Okay, um, I, I'm mindful of the time because I do want to leave some time for questions from the audience and also more importantly, we have drinks outside. Um, so moving on to the last topic and it's something close to the heart of all GCs and in-house counsel, time and costs. So uh, perhaps Justice Jaranam, you, you'll talk about this and, and perhaps sh share your own observations of some of the key developments that have made ADR, whether it's appropriate alternative dispute resolution more cost and time efficient, and does more have to be done? Well, bef before I answer your question, um, Rashta has gotten to AARD, so now you only need to find uh, words to fill the, let the letters V-A-R-K, and then we can say A is for aardvark. But to answer your, uh, uh, answer your question, I mean, you know, there are so many developments which have responded to, I guess, increasing cost in res resolution of disputes, and we've discussed many of them this evening. And I think it's uh, perhaps more interesting just to think, and, and, and I'll do it very briefly because I, I know we, are, we, we have uh, drinks waiting for us, um, to think about the future and, and, and the measures that we need to develop and, and, and build. One of them, of course, I've already mentioned, which is how we, uh, how, how we help businesses to manage their disputes, which, as I've said, may need a third party. There are limitations if that third party is uh, the court itself or, uh, an arb or and even more so an arbitrator because of questions of the role and how you go beyond uh, the, the, the adjudicative role that you, you have in the process, um, and then where one may think of third-party uh, managers of disputes uh, who just help to guide parties in that signal person role that I, I, I talked about earlier. I think that's a big development which will increase over the next uh, five years, hopefully in time for Rashta's uh, next book. And then the other 
uh, big thing, of course, is how we use uh, technology and the development of uh, AI uh, in order to help us. Uh, you know, it's it's an arms race, right? Uh, at one end, uh, technology is always increasing the complexity of disputes, but then on the other hand, we try and use technology to help us to manage those disputes. And there are many examples from the past that one can uh, r refer to. Um, AI, of course, has great potential uh, for that, but also needs to be managed uh, very carefully. Um, and uh, I would just suggest uh, always with a human uh, component to it and an active, wary, concerned uh, human component to uh, use AI as a tool. But I can see that being uh, a potential time and cost saver and dispute resolution. Roshka? Thank you, Paul. Um, I agree with the president that technology, you know, can be a, 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 a benefit and a burden. But I think at the moment it is hopefully going in the right way to support uh, problem solving rather than creating the problems. I think the other way, um, you, some of you may be aware that in England they've introduced compulsory mediation, uh, which sounds like a uh, sort of oxymoron because everybody understands mediation to be one of those very consensual uh, processes. Um, and it was challenged in court, and the court said, what are you whinging about? You can, you can go to mediation, why wouldn't you, and so on. It's worth reading Chur uh, Churchill and um, uh, Merthyr Tidfil is the, is the case. Um, and, it, and that's for lower courts at the moment, so it's for small claims. But it looks like it's going to creep up and up and up. So your, you know, gazillion pound claim, gazillion dollar claim is likely also to go to compulsory mediation. And I think that's a reflection of the acceptance of those steps before you go to court. And then the other two things I think that are supporting those steps is what Justice Allsop said, which is the how can I help? The court actually saying, how can I help? And that's exactly what the president just said. How can the court help you rather than just be there, you know, with the stick and its sword? But how can I help you to get through this problem? I think the Intergraph scheme is going to be very interesting because it sounds a little bit like a sort of triage of your dispute. So the way you go to, into A&E and and somebody checks you over and says, no, 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 it's not your little finger, you've actually broken your back. So the, you now need to go for x-ray and this and this and this. And I think that would actually, again, support all the forms of dispute resolution that are open to you. And it might leave some that need to go to court, but at least you now have a way somebody can look at it and help you, guide you, direct you um, in the right place. So you have the time and cost economies that I think businesses, you know, that's at the back of their minds. Lawyers forget, I'm afraid, but it is at the back of their minds. It costs them a lot to try and get through these disputes. Just also. Uh, the, the, very briefly, what I'd add is one great danger in all this is, and I'm not it, it's not a contrary argument to as many appropriate alternatives as possible. But the one great danger, and lawyers do it all the time, if unless they have some sort of electric shock therapy, that when they do it, they get a, some... They over-bureaucratise it and they wrote rules about it and 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 then over-structure over it. Some things need structure. You, you need a degree of structure for m most things in life, but then you can overstructure something. Uh, and, and what mediation becomes is the preliminary to the next stage and with its own cost base, and then the next stage is this and the next stage. And that's, again, that's a question of culture. That's a question of business culture, of legal culture, and of going back and always saying, always saying how what is the problem we've got and what is the best way of solving it and not going to a textbook and say right well what we do first is ask for particulars and then we need discovery and then we have you know they're like they're good old-fashioned way in the 1980s I mean I used, you know, I used to make a living writing answers to particulars you know <laughs> I mean hopefully junior barristers don't anymore you know 
they probably don't know what an interrogatory is. Um, but that is a that is something always you need that little that little creature on your shoulder at all times saying, "Why are you doing this? Is is this too? Is it overly structured? Is there a better way? Of, you know, think think. What's the best way to do this? Um, and and the same for courts, the same for judges, and 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 because it's a dynamic flow, it's not a building. It's not something that is built and then le and then sits. It's it's a flow or a process, uh, and 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 the culture has to be kind of rejuvenated with each generation. Be pragmatic. And be pragmatic. Exactly. Thank you. Um, I didn't turn off the icon to get us to drinks, but uh, uh, maybe we could take, have time for a couple of questions um, and then we can move on to drinks. But um, th does anyone, especially the in-house counsel here, who have some pressing questions that you may want to put forward to our distinguished panel? We'll start naming and shaming people. William, you're a... Act in house counsel in a big construction company. I mean, what are your thoughts in terms of the dispute resolution, um, litigation, or, or arbitration? Do you have any comments? Uh, speaking as a general counsel, uh, my, my challenge is I have to, I have, I'm the interface, I have to deal with both internal people as well as external people. Uh, managing external counsel is really our role. Uh, the two mentioned about resolution of disputes by senior executive, I, I've seen it happen myself uh, because they know the business, they know the end objective, they know whether there's any lead, you know, what they can give to reach to a settlement position. But my problem is usually on interfacing on the external side. Uh, what uh, uh, Justice also mentioned, um, the, the, the external counsel has a tendency to overstructure things and want things to be... They see the pathway to, to, to the end, whether it's an award, whether it's a successful mediation, uh, very rigidly. So what guidance do, does the book have, for example, for, for in-house counsel about managing these this external partners? I may want to take this because, I mean, you've been in in-house counsel role in a construction company. So, I mean, how have you dealt with these things? It, so, so I think I think... The, the main thing, so again, what I learned, and especially I went from being a barrister where I'm one removed from the client on the whole, the lay client. Um, so it was a surprise to everyone, but they asked me to come to that role, actually to set up a law, you know, legal team. And I said, you know, I don't really know how to manage because I haven't done anything like that except manage, you know, junior teams. They said, oh, no, you'll be fine. You'll be great. So I, I had a go. And believe me, don't worry about what area of the law you move into or practice in or learn about because it all hopefully adds adds to your skills and your expertise. So I wouldn't worry about becoming focused on a one trough. You can be lots of things in law and they all teach you things. So one of the things that I, I think is a standout to explain to people in-house, especially when they join a team, but also when you're speaking to externals, is the commercial imperative. So one of the things always to ask your business is, what do you want out of this? Whether it's front-end or, or, or back-end. Because even front-end, they want to do something, and there is a 
you know, good way to do it and a, not a, such a good way or unlawful way <laughs> to do it. So ask them what it is they want to do. And it is always commercial in nature because they want to make something happen. And that's the same when there's a dispute. They want to make something happen. Normally, yes, get rid of the dispute, but in a way that, that they keep the relationship going, they keep the project going, they keep the resources on the project going, and they're not sidetracked into running a big case, giving statements, appearing in court, or arbitration, etc. So I think it's always coming back to how is this actually helping the business? You know, how is your argument helping the business? Is it just an argument you want to run up to the high court or is it, a, is it an argument that's actually going to help solve the problem? So it is the solving problem, be pragmatic. I think we've all said that. And keep, keep the person who's really important in the picture, in the picture, and that's the business itself. It's not for the lawyers, I keep saying it. The disputes or the transaction isn't for the lawyers. They are a means by which the result is achieved, but it is the business you're doing it for. So I think I think stressing to external um, that, you know, we need a pragmatic resolution to this um, and that fine, fine argument, neither party will care about, I can tell you that, neither party will care, care about. And one example actually is time bars. You know, I mean, I've run time bars and the business has said, look, we'll let them have that if they drop this claim and do that and do that. They don't want to take it up to the High Court and or the, in England, the Supreme Court. They want an answer that gets them through it quickly and allows them to move on. They just want to move on. Thank you, Rashda, for your practical advice. Time for one last question before um, we will break for drinks. Okay. Um, okay. Oh, Mr. Nish wants to ask a question. <laughs> Uh, something about the power of mediation and when mediation was really sort of introduced in the Singapore context in a big way. Um, so one of the problems we faced was neither combatant in the litigation wanted to sort of show weakness by saying they want to go to mediation. So what the courts started to do, and uh, Justice Jaratnam and the other practitioners will remember this, they would send letters to both parties. And the letter would effectively say, your case has been carefully chosen as being suitable for mediation. So then you take that letter back to your client and say, our case has been carefully chosen by the court as being suitable for mediation. And then you start the mediation process without having to show that you've sort of uh, shown weakness in any way. And I think the statistics proved that... Uh, that was a really good way of getting people into the room. And when they got into the room, then the magic happened and a lot of settlements occurred through that. So that was just a, an anecdote to share from a Singapore experience. Yeah. And, 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 and Nish, that's really, that's really a very helpful comment because mediation is one of those where people, you know, as I said, in, in relation to Churchill and Merthyr Tidfil, it is a... It is a, people think it's only if I want to do it, will I do it? You can't make me do it. Now, the, I think the pendulum's, you know, swinging a little bit towards people accepting that actually I need to try it. And another justice who, who sat, I'm not sure she does, Paddy, does she still sit at, does she still sit at the SIC? No, no, so her term is over. I can tell you one of the hardest questions to answer when uh, you stood in her court, and it happened to me, and I squirmed, uh, was, Miss Rana, has your client considered mediation? If you said no, the next one was, why not? And believe me, that's how she asked you. Why not? And then what do you say to them? Oh, we don't want to do it. We don't care. I mean, you come up with things like, there's no point, the parties are so far apart, and so on. But she, you know, she could just stare you down, and that was just as good as a carefully considered for mediation point and we'd go outside and say we better tell the client we need to mediate this and you know it worked it worked so whichever way it happens I think the support of the courts in this as I keep, I keep calling it a jigsaw puzzle if there's a piece missing it ain't gonna work and I think the court is a very very important part of this big jigsaw puzzle um, and and I think it's becoming 
a very, not just a useful, helpful part, but it is actually, uh, there are hardly any courts left in the world that, that feel ADR is a an affront to their power, their jurisdiction to deal with disputes. They actually welcome it and they can see the benefit of it for them, for the parties involved, and for trade and commerce more generally. And the, and the one, just very quickly, the one thing that compulsory mediation can do, even 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 in a, a culture where they probably already have mediated and the people you're making mediate really are, are intransigent, in, in the mediations I've done both as a practitioner and now as a mediator, very often the mutual benefit to both parties, even when it doesn't settle, is they come out with a far greater appreciation of their own weaknesses, of where things will fall away, and even if it doesn't settle, the mutual knowledge about the dispute almost certainly will make it a different case to run than it would have been had they never spoken to each other, frankly. Okay, on that note, could you just join me in thanking our panellists? Um, thank you, Justice Sheridan, for coming. Um, I should mention that Justice also did fly all the way from Sydney and rushed out from London, but I know before we break for drinks, yes. we the, the publishers want us to launch the book by signing on it or the, the mock book. We so. didn't have a bottle of champagne to <laughs> chuck it <laughs> so in, I think we would have had to do. Um, um, so I think we're going to sign this billboard, is um, there a pen? which is the front page. Uh, some, some magic pen. So, so please don't, don't run off because um, there are drinks um, uh, outside the reception. <laughs>